right <coughs> so i'm i'm in this presentation i'm going to cover uh, approximately uh, two or three portions which will slightly sound disjointed but uh, just try to follow what we are going to see all right so um, at the current point of time a basic understanding of spinal control of movement is something like this where we have our uh, pyramidal tract from the cerebral cortex that comes and supplies the alpha motor neuron so here you see the alpha motor neuron uh, which is white in color and it supplies the muscle fibers right on the side you see the tendon part of it which tells that the also muscle contracts it will be pulling so uh, what we are thinking is uh, what we were thinking is uh, once the input comes from the pyramidal tract to the anterior horn cell the anterior horn cell will send impulses to the muscle and you will see that the muscle is going to have a contraction okay right so on the uh, right side you see the muscle in a contracted state right now <coughs> we saw that in the last class as i said before uh, recall before that uh, muscle cannot be controlled like this because the muscle fibers are not the only things there are other um, structures which basically uh, are not under the control of the nervous system so now what happens is we have two things one is under the control of the nervous system the other one is not under the control of the nervous system so that whatever you send as impulse and the amount of force produced do not translate directly okay right so that's what is a non linear control of movement okay right so uh, now let us go a little bit behind and uh, see how the spinal control was initially studied and how it was uh, conceived okay right i have repeated this uh, many a times but since some new people are also there i'm just going to repeat it a little bit more all right so uh, we got a lot of understanding about the um, how the brain is controlling the movement by first studies of sh <coughs> sharing <coughs> now way back in 1905 uh, what how sherington studied the uh, control of the movements was he uh, created um, he was taking animals and he cut the brain of the animals at different levels you can see here on the left hand side that there's something called as animal preparation this is the brain of the animal and uh, you can see here the you can see here uh, the uh, brain is cut at uh, different levels okay right to one level 2 level 3 right like this he had uh, cut the brain and uh, what he did was uh, once he had cut the cerebral cortex and left the other portions intact he gave different types of stimulus you can see that the animal is held in one position and then the animal is shifted to other position and they saw how the uh, animal was moving and uh, um, they saw that the animals were moving in a slightly stereotypical pattern of movements and they called that as reflex movements right so accordingly uh next what he did was he had cut at a slightly lower level that is at the midbrain level and then he saw how the reflexes were acting now the same stimulus produced a slightly different types of reflexes then they call that as brain stem reflexes and then still down in the um the um, brain stem they had cut and they saw only with the spinal cord when they had uh, repeated the same experiment with the same stimulus they got a different responses then they call that as spinal reflexes so ultimately what the he concluded from his experiments was the <coughs> the movements are controlled by the brain by different levels of reflexes and the stimulus will produce a particular response and depending on the level of damage the type of output which we are getting might be slightly different 
okay right so um, uh, this is how the brain was studied in olden days of sherrington okay right. now um right so for whatever uh, response to be produced you need to give a stimulus okay that's that's how they understood the movement However, uh, there were slight disagreements with these findings um, after a certain period of time, uh, even during the period of Sherrington before he died, there were certain uh, findings which were coming, which were not in tune or in line with, with these kind of, um, with these results, okay, right? One uh, of the major, uh, one of the major problem was some people, they had tried cutting out the sensory nerves, right? And then they um, <coughs> had put the animal in a similar positions, right? And then they saw that uh, the animals were sometimes producing movement even without them giving any stimulus, but the same responses were coming, right? So, this basically questioned and it uh, challenged the notion that all the movements are produced by a stimulus. Okay, right? So, this was the first uh, problem which uh, the Sherrington's uh, model of how to, uh, how we are studying the movement and how the brain controls the movement was challenged. Okay. Right? Then the second problem, uh, what happened was uh, the movements um, when Sherrington conceived the notion of uh, stimulus and response, he saw that the responses were more stereotyped. So whenever you had cut at a particular level, say spinal level or the uh, higher levels, when you gave a stimulus, the same responses were coming, right? So that's what the um, uh, finding and that's why he concluded that it's a reflex. That is, it happens more automatically and it's very much stereotyped. But as the developments went on, we got the EMG. The EMG were, were primarily not available during the time of sharing. Um, and the uh, <coughs> kinematic analysis, these instruments weren't available during the time of sharing. So when these instruments came, when people had fixed EMG electrodes on the limb and they studied the kinematics, what they saw was the uh, ultimate movement was happening, but each time the movement was happening, it was not the same. It was coming with very varied uh, uh, responses were there. For example, each time the limb of the animal, that's the frog you can see here, when it was moving, each time the movement was very different. It was not following the same trajectory and it was changing. Right. So now, uh, if you assume that a stimulus produces a response, uh, then it is not possible for a stimulus to produce multiple types of responses. It can produce one response, but it cannot produce multiple responses. Okay, right? So this particular feature of uh, variable movements uh, were not observed by Sherrington predominantly, but he, so therefore he concluded uh, that it is a um, um, stereotypical response. Okay, right? Okay. So now such disagreements started coming in the earlier periods. And then later on, um, when the sophisticated biomechanical analysis could be done, that is when we were looking into the length tension relationship uh, in the last class, we very well saw that the <coughs> force curve of the inverted U shape, which we normally think should happen when they closely observed, it was all different, right? So uh, we started understanding that there is something more beyond what we are observing, right? So fundamentally, our analysis and understanding of how the internal system was functioning was challenged, okay? Right. 
predominantly at that period of time sherington's time after sherington there was pavlov then there were few more scientists predominantly they were all um, primarily they were doing studies of neurophysiology they had a lot of understanding of neuroanatomy okay so uh, their predominant uh, the findings whatever they were coming out with were looked upon from their view point okay right so how the anatomical structures are there and how the physiological uh, how the anatomical structures are interconnected with each other uh, during the times when we were discussing about sherington we went in length and we discussed about uh, how the uh, connections were there and what were the different stimuluses and what were the different responses right so that was a view point now once sophisticated levels of analysis came there were certain other people uh, who also came into the picture like physicists right those who were in the field of physics and uh, they had a deep understanding about mathematics mathematics and everything so for them when your input and the output were not matching precisely they had uh, to come out with a better formulation so so predominantly they challenged the assumptions of the previous uh, uh, scientists and they came to a conclusion that motor control is being studied predominantly from lesion studies of brain okay right pathological brain function was used in order to explain how a normal movement is produced but rather we are not studying a person who is performing a movement and trying to understand how the movement can be controlled okay right so um so now what happened was there was uh, people started studying normal movement control because now sophisticated equipments were there we can uh, indirectly without um, going inside and doing any changes to the system we can study that okay. so there were a few um, russian scientists and one of them is anatol feldman uh, right he uh, he and his colleagues did uh, try studying it differently so how they tried studying it was um, they used to uh, see the movement of animals how it is going they used similarly cats and other things and then um, they literally used to run behind the animal and give a stimulation to the brain okay right and uh, the uh, anatol uh, felman himself told uh, when we visited him that uh, they used to literally run behind a cat and give a stimulus to the cat's uh, brain and they saw how the movements were changing okay right so that's just an anecdote but he did one uh, critical experiment in order to understand how the brain might be controlling the movement it's called as unloading experiment now what is this unloading experiment okay right so uh, primarily he he and his colleagues they studied the length tension curve last class we had seen the same thing they had studied okay just tell uh, uh can you see the screen uh, yes sir yeah <coughs> so what basically he studied was they had um plotted a curve right so they plot the uh, length in the right of the uh, muscle and the uh, tension okay right so um how do we plot this is we 
are going to keep a emg electrode right and then we are going to pull the muscle to different lengths and at each length what is the tension it develops for so study okay right <coughs> so what did he do he uh, produced he actually did this length tension uh, relationship he studied this length tension relationship by doing two or three different experiments now in a first experiment what he did was he asked a person all right to this is the limb okay right this is your arm this is your forearm okay right clear and then they actually gave a weight right on the arm and then uh, what they did was they asked a person to move the weight to a new position okay right so the person had to lift the weight okay right so now when the person is moving from one position to other position uh what do you think uh, happens which part of the nervous system is active you have your brain right you have your spinal cord right and you have your muscle right so you have one your brain two your spinal cord and three your muscle okay right so amongst these three things which do you think is contributing much to this <coughs> the yeah. muscle okay when you are moving a uh, object from one position to other position right the muscle ultimately the muscle will have to act there is no other thing but uh, uh, which part of these three do you think is uh, contributing more to it or from where does the command come the brain brain right so your brain will have to um tell the person that he has to move from one position to the other position okay right <coughs> okay Bye. so in this what they did was when they were um, moving right so they were studying um, i'll just come to it at a later part of time right now we'll move on to the uh, second uh, part of the now he did another one where he asked the person to completely relax the arm okay right clear and then uh, what he did was he stretched out the uh, muscle okay right and then he studied the length tension relationship okay right clear so in this particular point which part of the nervous of the three do you think is uh, being studied the person was asked to relax his limb completely right and then uh, in the end portion the muscle was stretched and he studied the and he plotted the length tension curve since there is no intention it should must be mostly towards the muscle so in this uh, we in this the muscle is being studied okay right so now we have brought in two conditions okay right condition number 1 where your brain was um, asked to be activated right and the person was moving the low okay right 
<coughs> and the second one was completely at rest it was done right so we know that in the first one the brain is uh, uh, giving the major control and in the second one the muscle is giving the major <coughs> now when they when he plotted the curve okay right and he plotted the curve right what he saw was when the person was moving the uh, um, uh, in the first in the first experiment when the person was moving right he saw that the uh, length tension curve right was uh, um, shifting like this okay right and in the second situation right he saw that one day when the muscle was there right the tension was not increasing much but there was a bit amount of tension like this okay right yeah so these were the two curves which he got now we'll move on to the third component of the experiment right so now what he did was he asked the person to maintain the limb like this and he gave a weight okay right so <coughs> now what he did was he said to the person who was holding the weight that you should not do anything i'm going to do something to the weight you are not supposed to do anything okay right that's what he gave right and then what he did was suddenly he removed this weight away okay right so he took this weight away so what do you think would have happened here more of a spinal level control work. because um because the person has been uh, specifically told not to do any any uh, not to obstruct the movement and yeah. and it is right. a reflexive level where it should be most probably from the spinal control okay right so that's 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 the correct direction so what what, what do you think would have happened to this limb when he had removed the weight the hand would have gone down gone down like this like this so oh, sir it would have gone up a uh, rebound yeah it, it it just went to this level and then it stopped here okay right yeah. so now as shaikh sir correctly said all right in the first instance we had asked them to uh, move the limb right to a new position and we studied uh by perturbing by giving perturbation right so i'm not going into the detail of that particular part of the experiment and the second one he had done this okay right now what they did was uh, this particular experiment was done in multiple positions with multiple weights okay right so they did it in this position first they did it in this position giving a weight then they did it in this position giving a weight then they did it in this position each position they used to give the weight and he used to remove it okay so primarily uh, this was the um, what to say the genius of anatol feldman where he did not create any lesion in the brain but he knew how he can try and activate different portions of the body right and then what is happening what is when we are trying to um, make the different portions work what is happening okay right so now we will go to the findings so the first finding uh, i'll start from the muscle level when when no action was happening right this is the length tension relation you saw that when they kept a different lengths right the there was no appreciable increase in tension okay right number 1 number 2 when they saw the spinal level 
all right what they saw was this curve which was more flatter all right they saw that as you increase the length the tension started rising okay right clear and at the third level when your brain was acting actually right at one point you had this curve and at other point the curve moved on here okay right <coughs> so so i didn't understand yeah. the third one curves third one uh, the brain level brain level of active movement one i didn't understand the curve yeah all right so so when you when you are plotting this curve all right basically uh, you have a particular length and you have a particular level of tension right yes sir right hmm. so in all the curves it is the same yes. right yeah so what they saw was in the when the brain when they asked them to move from one position to the other position okay right what happened was the first curve uh, initially in one position there was this first curve and then what happened was sorry the curve moved on to here okay okay right so basically okay. this is a length tension plot so if you have a emg you can find out how much tension is coming and you can uh, know the length uh, if you are uh, moving it in different angles right okay all right so the curve moved on here like this okay right so there were not two curves one curve moved on to the other place okay 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 okay, right? okay all right so primarily he observed that when only the muscle is there and no command is coming from the muscle you get this particular curve and then this curve and then third that curve okay right so from this curve he started trying to bring out why could the curve be like this all the time okay right and <coughs> this curve was very similar to another curve which um, was produced when you are trying to stretch a rubber band okay or a spring right so basically the muscle was predominantly acting like a spring or a rubber band okay right so let us uh, look into the curve of the rubber band Okay, right. So you have a small rubber band here. All right. Yeah. So uh, when the rubber band is at rest, right? When you are going to pull the rubber band, right? You will not see much of tension in the uh, initial period when you are making it like this. Okay. Right. Clear. Yeah. Like this. And then what happens is when you are going to pull the rubber band still longer, right? Now the rubber rubber band will exert a force on you. right now let's take for example this is length 1 of the rubber band this is length 2 of the rubber band and this is length 3 of the rubber band okay right clear so the amount of tension which it generates in each of these lengths will be increasing uh, like this will be increasing like this okay right so <coughs> when you stretch the rubber band a little bit okay right there will be a small increase in the tension but when you pull it more and more right you will see that higher and higher levels of tension will ensue so you will have a curve which is initially more flatter and then it will start uh spiking up okay right this is a very common phenomena and all of us would have at one or the other point of time would have always uh, uh, known this okay right so <coughs> if you take instead of rubber band a uh, spring okay right and you are going to stretch the spring right initially it will be easy to stretch the spring 
but when you are trying to pull it with more force you will see that it will give a lot of resistance okay right so <clears throat> now what happens is this muscle was actually behaving uh, like a rubber band or a spring right and so the rules which were governing the length and tension relationship of a rubber band or a spring was similar here so the rule is force which is generated right is directly proportional to the length of the rubber band or the spring right similarly he saw that the force is directly proportional to the length of the uh, muscle okay right the greater and greater we pull the muscle greater and greater the resistance increased right clear yeah. so this is what he understood okay right because the previous people were uh, physiologists they weren't able to uh, understand what is the relation but since they were physicists it was easier for them to just uh, plot a curve and then uh, learn the characteristic of the curve and then predict what will happen at a other point of time right so one of the beauty of mathematics or physics is its ability to predict what will happen so it is not necessary that you need to keep on measuring tension all the time but if you can plot the curve once you can understand that at one level of length what will be the force at another level of length what will be the force right so it is possible for us to predict here yeah? so this is the equation they derived right now he also derived a second equation right which is f is equal to k this is called as a spring constant or the um elastic constant and length we will come to the second equation at a later point of time but now we will we will go back and look into this particular equation right that is force generated is directly proportional to the length okay right so i will um, i'll just take a small break here and uh, up until this point if you did not understand or if you could not connect with the concept you can please ask sir uh, can you repeat the spring example uh, the spring spring example yes. uh, a spring or a rubber band if you are so going similar. to pull it okay right they act very similarly right so when you pull it uh, in the initial portion you will give you will get less resistance and uh, if you are pulling it to larger and larger lengths the force which it is giving on you or the resistance which it is giving will keep increasing uh, more um, what to say more vertical right that is for smaller change in length there will be a larger amount of resistance which will be given by that so if you are pulling 1 cm in the initial portion of a rubber band or a spring the amount of resistance what it gives right will be less but if you have already stretched it to 10 cm and after that if you are pulling 1 cm at that time it will be producing a uh, more resistance as compared to the initial one cm um prasti so so the ef is a resistance or the force that we are applying on the no the force uh, the resistance which the spring or the other or the rubber band is giving that giving. is what we are talking okay okay right okay, we, we can pull it with less force we can pull it with more force okay. whatever it is but then the amount of tension which is generated by the uh, rubber band or spring and the amount of pull it is giving on you back Okay, okay, right? Or the resistance which it gives—that's what we are talking. We are not talking about the force with which I'm pulling. Okay. Okay. Um, is it clear? Anyone have any doubts up until this point of time? Okay, I'll just uh, quickly summarize uh, <coughs> what was done. All right. So, point number one. 
um, Sherrington predominantly studied pathological movement and then he derived stimulus producer response. But then with the advent of technology like EMG um, um, with video analysis and the force torque measurement devices, which all started coming, there were a new people that is physicists started coming in. Uh, one of them was Anatole Feldman and, his, uh, and their uh, colleagues. Not only Anatole Feldman, a lot of scientists were doing experiments. And uh, what they did was they wanted, to, they said that when you're studying a pathological movement and deriving uh, how the brain is controlling the movement, they, the scientific findings, which were other findings, were not in concert with them and it was contradictive. Okay, right? So what they did was they wanted to study how a normal movement is being produced. So primarily they wanted to study how the muscle is functioning and how it is being controlled, right? So now, as we all know, the muscle is controlled from the pyramidal tract to the spinal cord. You have an anterior oncel and from anterior oncel, you have a, um, the muscle fibers, okay, right? So he wanted to segregate them. So instead of artificially making a cut in the brain, right? He kept the system intact. And then what he did was he studied the muscle separately. And then he studied the brain separately. And then he studied the spinal cord separately. In all these instances, what he did was he wanted to understand how the muscle was acting. Okay, right? So we saw three curves. The three curves were there. And uh, uh, all the three curves had some similarities. And there were also some differences. The similarity was the, there was a curve which was initially flatter and then it raised, which means that when you initially uh, um, lengthen the muscle, it will give only less amount of tension. And as you increase the length of it, the tension will increase exponentially. Okay, right? Clear? So now what he clearly understood was that the muscle is acting like a rubber band or a... <coughs> Uh, uh, spring. Okay, right. Yeah. So now the only question which remains is how can a muscle act like a spring, right? Now, in a resting state, we know that a muscle has muscle fibers and it is surrounded by muscle uh, fascicles, uh, sorry, the uh, perimysium, endomysium, epimysium. So you have certain things which have elastic, uh, um, it's a connective tissue which has elastic fibers. You also have a tendon, it also has elastic fibers, right, clear? So uh, a resting muscle without any uh, command from brain would act like that, okay, right? Because it has elastic fibers. So the anatomical finding of connective tissue and its composition can explain that. Now the thing is, when the brain is not sending a command and when the spinal cord alone is acting and the voluntary will is not controlling the movement, but you're just pulling out a book, right? So it's unloading. So at that particular point of unloading, what happens is the muscle is again behaving in a similar manner. So now the question is, how does the muscle uh, controlled like a rubber band? That's the question, okay? So now we will go back into the spinal cord uh, and uh, see how it is being cut. Right. <clears throat> so, we initially saw that alpha motor neuron was controlling the brain and that's what is our current understanding. But here, we need to understand that there are certain additional structures which are there, which we predominantly initially thought that it was basically a sensory organ, which was giving information to the brain about that. And that is your muscle spindles. Okay, right? So you have your... Is the screen visible? Yes, 
One second. <clears throat> Yeah, right. So um, now you have the muscle spindle, all right? So many of us who have learned the muscle so the screen is not visible, sir. Screen is not visible. Yeah, now is it visible? Uh, yes, sir. Now it's visible. Yeah, right. So previously we had seen about the uh, muscles uh, spindles, and we know that the muscle spindles function is primarily to inform the brain about the length of the muscle. Okay, right. So <coughs> now the muscle spindle has two components. One is the central portion. The other one is the uh, peripheral portion you can see here all right yeah the central portion consists of uh, the sensory fibers which take the information to the brain through 1a fibers okay right but the peripheral portion that is these this one and this one these two portions all right have muscle fiber like structures which can contract right so this neuron, which is here, it is called as a gamma motor neuron. And this gamma motor neuron predominantly sends impulses to the peripheral portion. Okay. Right. So this gamma motor neuron sends impulses to the peripheral portion. And now what happens is, once it sends impulses to the peripheral portion, this portion will contract like a muscle uh, fiber. Okay, right. Once it contracts, right, what will happen to the central portion? The central portion will be stretched. Once it is stretched, the information will go to the nervous system through the 1A fibers, which are sensory neurons, which will take it. This neuron where it will go and end is, it will go and end in the alpha motor neuron. Okay, right. Clear? So now, if you look into this, what happens is, the working is something like this. First, the gamma is activated. Once the gamma is activated, what will happen is, the central portion can be, will be stretched. Once the, the central portion is stretched, the 1A fibers which will be activated, they will go and supply the alpha motor neuron. And then that alpha motor neuron, as we all know, will bring about the contraction of the muscle. Okay, right? And once the muscle contracts, what will happen? The spindle will also shorten and it will come to its neutral position. Okay, right? So I want you to visualize this uh, steps one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. Right. So now what will happen first, uh, right? Instead of alpha being activated, let's assume that the gamma is activated, right? So if the gamma is activated, then the muscle spindle will be stretched. Once the muscle spindle is stretched, the brain gets information that the muscle is being lengthened. So what it will do, it will send an impulse to your uh, alpha motor neuron, all right? The one A will be, is connected to the alpha motor neuron. The alpha motor neuron, it will activate the actual muscle fibers, your actin and myosin fibers, and it will bring it back to the original position. Okay, right? Now, if you keep on rewinding this uh, once, uh, one, two, three loops, if you keep on rewinding, you will understand that whenever it is pulled apart, okay, right? Whenever the muscle is pulled apart, what will happen to the muscle? It will come closer. It will come closer, right? Right? 
so now you can see that it acts very much like a rubber band okay all right so this is called as a closed loop control and uh, um, by this mechanism it is it is feasible that a uh, muscle which normally is can be activated by alpha mono neuron can be controlled like a rubber band okay right so um they called um they detected that the uh, gamma motor neuron and the muscle spindles were not simply organ sensory organs which were giving information about the length of the muscle but they were trying to actively control the muscle by changing the function of the muscle from what we already know to a rubber band like structure any questions in understanding of this uh, closed loop control okay sir so, uh, yeah Sir, the uh, spindle stretch. Uh, how much amount of spindle stretch will, uh, uh, like, will will respond uh, will respond to an amount of muscle contraction? So this muscle spindle stretch is very minimal and small, right? And the compared to the muscle contraction. Yeah. <laughs> yes, a small amount of stretch when it's there, it just requires the one A to be activated. That's all. If one is activated, automatically the alpha motor neuron will be activated and it will produce a contraction of the muscle. Uh, sir, so basically every motor uh, uh, unit will have one, one muscle spindle stretch, something like that? Um, it's not necessary that it is like that because uh, when you see the nervous system, you have the nerves which are uh, diverging divergent systems right so what basically happens is say for example when one a is being activated right say for example this is one single neuron right and if it goes and supplies a group of neurons you can have at the same time activation of multiple neurons so it is not necessary that you activate if 10 alpha motor neurons are to be activated then 10 gamma motor neurons needs to be activated or 10 one a fibers needs to be activated. it's not like that <clears throat> okay right so if you add say for example three here and again three alpha motor neurons here right so this could be interneuron this could be 1a fiber right a small one can activate the much amount of alpha motor neuron the only thing is what we need to understand is once the muscle spindle returns to its normal position then the activation will stop Okay, okay. All right. So that's the key, right? So um, we, we, are not, we are not going to control the muscle in minute thing. The only purpose of the spinal cord is just to make, convert the muscle into a rubber band or a spring-like structure. That's it. Uh, sir, what activates this gamma? Right, so that's the that will be the uh, next one on Thursday. We'll be seeing this what activates a gamma and how does it activate the gamma. Yes, a short thing. Oh. Uh, sir, I'm having little doubt in anatomical uh, part, sir. Yeah, uh, usually, what uh, long back I have said, what uh, I have understood is uh, the central portion will not have the actin and myosin, it will have the uh, muscle spindle yeah uh, in the, the central portion we will have the muscle spindle the muscle spindle is having nuclear back fibers and nuclear chain fibers yeah so this uh, this is this yellow portion you are saying that's a nuclear back fibers sir it is both nuclear back and chain fibers so what is this blue color this uh, sorry this uh, violet uh, color uh, sir? the vi violet is the terminal portion of the muscle spindle where you have um, the ability of it to contract. So that is made up of? That's made up of actin myosin fibers. Okay, okay. This is the uh, intrafusal muscle fibers, right? 
So these ones we call them as the extrafusal muscle fibers, and this one we call them as the intrafusal muscle fibers. Okay, sir. So when they contract, they will stretch. So intrafusal muscle by fiber is supplied by gamma motor neuron. Extrafusal muscle fiber is supplied by alpha motor neuron. Alpha motor neuron. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sir. Yeah. So for those whom it is uh, slightly difficult to understand or connect things. Uh, uh, I think you can just uh, repeat uh, listening to this lecture again and then you can just come out with doubts or clarifications. So it will be <coughs> possible for us to <coughs> further go with this. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, right. So, any any uh, questions or any clarifications? Are you recording? So, what we are um, trying to um, do is we are just studying one portion of it. Just understanding one portion of it will not give you the whole understanding. We'll be going slowly into how it is translating to muscle control, how it is translating to joint control, how it is translating to whole movement control. Slowly, we will be going on to it, right? So in the previous, that is in the last class, I told only one thing that a muscle uh, per se, if you take simple muscle, it has two components. One is the one which can be controlled. The other one is which cannot be controlled directly by the nervous system. And they, therefore, they function non-linearly. Okay, right? So if they are functioning linearly, then you can predict what will happen in near future. But here, the prediction component is uh, not possible because it, will, it functions non-linearly. Okay, right? Those who have, don't understand the first year students and others who don't understand, you can keep asking questions further on, um, um, right in the group also, you can ask questions whenever you want. So, they'll come, right? So, that was the one thing we saw in the last one. Okay. Now, we have moved on to the second level, which is the spinal control. And we wanted to see how the spinal cord is controlling the muscle, right? So, that's what we saw. The function of the spinal cord is just one. It is previously the muscle had one portion which was controllable, the other portion which was acting like a, a rubber band or a spring, right? So two components we, it had. Now, this particular spinal cord, what it has done is it has converted the muscle, which was a contractile portion into a rubber band, right? So now we have together one rubber band, one big rubber band or one big spring is there in the periphery, right? And that spring is what is being activated. How it will be activated and uh, um, what are the factors that will activate it, that we'll be seeing in the cerebral control. How the cerebrum is bringing about the movement. Okay, right? So these are smaller portions of it. Uh, so in the next um, uh, class, that is on Thursday, we'll be looking into the brain control of it. Together, it's called as an equilibrium point model. Referent configuration model um, has a subcomponent which is called as equilibrium point model. If we understand the equilibrium point model, automatically we'll be able to understand and conceive the other things along with a few more um, uh, inputs. Okay, right? But uh, uh, yeah, right. So that's it. Okay, right? So thank you for uh, patient listening, and uh, we'll meet again on uh, Thursday for the next part of it. Okay, right? If anyone have any suggestions, inputs, or clarifications, you can ask. Others who are um, fine with that, who completely cannot follow or who partly follow and you're not able to understand things like that, you can further ask the question at any point of time. Uh, those who are, um, you can leave the class now. Okay, right? Those who have a question, uh, you can stay back. Otherwise, we will end the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.